Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Thank you. I think he's setting the bar too high. But by the way, great you know, data and, and analysis by DigiCapital, really appreciate it. That's really helpful. And although we disagree with the AR side, but I think, you know, really. <laughs> I have the microphone, you have that disadvantage. Look, we're really excited to be here, and I'll t uh, tell you who we are, but um, I'm excited about the panel. Panel really covers probably exposure to over 1,000 VR and AR firms, and then you'll hear from each uh, panel member their backgrounds and their awesome sort of perspectives on the sector. A little bit about uh, Evolution Media Capital. We're uh, both advisory firm as well as investment fund. We're an affiliate of Creative Artists Agency and TPG Capital. And I'm on the investment side. We have about a little bit over $500 million capital base to invest. Our primary focus is content and content ecosystems. As you all know, VR and AR will have transformative effect on the way we create, consume, publish, and, and really share content. So yeah, it's a key area of focus for us. But it's really, it's not about me, it's about the, the, this awesome panel and, and you guys. So, um, Tipitat Chenevasan, and he was most recently created director of Rothenberg Ventures, now he has Tipitat VR. I consider him really one of the foremost thought leaders in the VR AR sector. Thank you. And, and he single-handedly saw more than 400 companies in the sector and chose the first 13 for Rothenberg and looked at another 100. So he'll have incredible perspective. Cliff, um, not only he's head of John Studios, but also he's one of the um, fortunate seed investors in Oculus. I won't say anymore. <laughs> and Alex from Highland Capital, you know, real top tier premier firm and he's one of the, again, the, the leaders and in investors investing in VR, AR space, invested in John, one of the uh, sort of real most recognized and, and well-capitalized and well-managed teams and uh, with exciting technology and, and vision. And Jeff uh, from Boost VC, they also have the probable distinction of having one of the largest VR, AR uh, portfolio, 18 companies currently. So really, combination, the, the four individuals will give you incredible perspectives. I'm, I'm really excited about uh, what they're going to say and, and what you're going to ask and how they're going to answer. But I'm going to turn it over to sort of each one to give your perspective, your background, your vision, expectations for the sector, and, and take no more than 30 seconds. Okay. So. Sure. Uh, sorry, that was really loud. So right now, I feel like like VR, like everyone's asking, like, what's the killer app? You know, what's going to make it go mainstream? And a lot of people are looking at, oh, mobile VR and this consumption of, of really interesting media on mobile devices that are going to be widespread. But no, I don't think that's really what's going to make VR happen. I think now that we have real quality input devices and we're going to let people create and design in VR, that's when VR is really going to take off, when it goes from being a consumption platform to an actual creation platform. And that's going to be the difference maker. I agree 100% with that. Uh, a lot of um, content today has really been to show off technology, show off products, um, but now it's, it really needs content that's really going to drive an audience and, and make this really a consumer product for, um, you know, for the near future. So it's, to me, it's all about content. Yeah, the, the last couple of years, have, as we've watched the space, it's been really interesting to watch the core pieces of the technology that's necessary to actually create a decent experience really form. And uh, we sort of felt that, um, you know, in the last year, it's really been the first time when you can actually have a decent experience for most people. And uh, so then the two next problems you have to solve are, as Cliff said, create great content, tell some great stories with this amazing technology that you've created, you know, create great um, immersive environments for people to play around in, um, and then obviously distribution. Um, so we're right on the early, I, I'd say we're kind of at this sort of middle part of the technology development curve and we're probably early on the content development part of the curve and we're super early on the distribution side of the curve and that that's how we kind of think about where we are in the market yeah. so we look at a lot of vr companies and right now we don't know what success looks like in vr so i think that there are a number of applications that will be purpose-built using the medium so i saw a good example the other day when the iphone first came out had solitaire on it. It was a desktop game. It was very boring, it was hard to see, and it wasn't until we started shooting Angry Birds that people realized that the phone itself should be integrated into the technology. With VR, we're looking at some really interesting technologies. Um, the infrastructure layer is set, and that's exciting, but 
content creation and tools that allow people to participate in this new medium will expose the aha moments that we all see and say, that's how you do it. I don't think we've seen them yet. Thank you. Cliff, uh, just uh, changing the uh, discussion a little bit, you know, given a little bit about your background, if you can talk about that, sure. and, and how really got you got involved with Oculus, because there are other attempts in the past. Sure. What really made you choose them? And obviously, you know, it's a great outcome uh, for everyone. Yeah, I come more from the film industry and working with a lot of top filmmakers who always have a vision of something that, you know, is in their head, and we've always had to figure out how do we put that on the screen. And then when you're on the screen, it really takes audiences to amazing places, see amazing things that is is great in that traditional content. So when I when I when I I've known Brendan for a long time and when he first showed me what he was working on with Palmer before there was an Oculus, um, and it was this crazy cardboard contraption with a lot of wires hanging out of it. And I tried it, I immediately saw like, okay, th this is this is awesome. This is this is where you can go into really immersive content. Now they were always thinking about gaming. You know, their their focus right from the beginning was gaming. I immediately saw, you know, live action. You know, how do we take, you know, things that I've done in the film industry and bring people to these immersive worlds that I think was just no, going to be a whole new form of storytelling. And so, Brendan was thinking about gaming, and Palmer was thinking about gaming. I immediately said, guys, you got to think about live action. And in the early days of Oculus, I would bring a lot of filmmaker friends down to Irvine, see it. They would get excited. It was still very early, and obviously there were a lot of limitations. You know, uh, Brendan would always ask me, you know, bring Jim Cameron down, bring Jimmy Cameron down. I'm like, the last thing in the world you want is Jim Cameron to come down here right now, because it, it's not ready for those, tor those sorts of filmmakers. But over time, and it's, it's getting there, it's getting to the point where now we can work with the top filmmakers. And that's where, again, we think about what's possible. When you start working with creatives like that, again, they're gonna come up with a thousand ideas that we could never think about in a lab or in a, an engineering environment that now needs to push it. You know, when I was at, you know, working at Lucasfilm and working with George and a lot of big filmmakers, in that situation, a lot of, they have an idea, you know, we'd be sitting in meetings talking about, all right, how do we create Davy Jones for Pirates of the Caribbean? And we're like, we got it, and the back of our heads have no idea how the hell we're gonna do this. <laughs> I feel like VR is there right now. It's like we have, you know, as you're hearing from the panel, we have the platform, we have the architecture in place from the capture side, you know, a bit on the distribution, the HMDs are getting better. Now it's gotta be that creative vision that's gotta drive things that we haven't even thought about yet, but let's just figure it out how to do it. Yeah, thank you. And as you know, Facebook's acquisition really sort of kick-started the, the whole um, awareness and, and, and investment across major media and tech companies. Jeff, you're sort of setting the, uh, laying the groundwork for seed early stage. And as the, you, know, you look, look at DigiCapital forecasts and growth rates, how do you really choose them for longevity? And how do you, you know, sort of, uh, well, how do you guide them? Uh, it's a great question. And just for the benefit of the audience, um, what Boost BC is, stage accelerator. So we invest in very early companies, uh, small amounts of money, small teams, uh, normally the first money in, and we base it on the idea and the team and the passion of the team to see this idea come to fruition. So really we guide our teams to not die, to make sure that they <laughs> survive until there's some customers to sell things to. So we teach them to be very frugal, we teach them to be very innovative uh, in their design and how they get customers. And specifically, we, 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 we ask them to get feedback from those customers too, so that they can hopefully turn them into sources of revenue. And we're seeing a lot of new approaches, I think, in VR, things that have not been tried from a customer acquisition standpoint. Um, one of the benefits that we have at, at Boost is we have these companies working together in the same physical space. And so they're all facing similar challenges and they work as R&D teams for each other. Um, so really, the specific tactics that we coach them on to survive in VR are no different than any startup company in any other emerging technology sector. Yeah. By the way, it's no coincidence that you're sitting next to Alex in terms of follow-on financing. Alex, you've been oh, one of the... <laughs> I've been set up. <laughs> 
You know, you know, you and Redpoint and uh, and Reese and obviously you guys have been really at the forefront of investing in VR and AR. What was your initial sort of expectations, and how did you guys sort of get involved, and 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 what was the sort of you know long term vision? Yeah, so um, so it's interesting historically, right? Because Jaunt started before this amazing acquisition of Oculus, and so you you got to give a lot of credit to the founders because they they basically, well, one of them the story goes that one of them basically went into the desert uh, for vacation and um, and had a vision quest. No, I'm just kidding. He he um, <laughs> he uh, he had this experience where he was looking at all this beautiful na you know beautiful nature with all this scale, and he said you know he starts taking pictures with his digital camera. He's like, I just it's, I just can't capture the natural beauty of this. And any of us who have really spent time outdoors uh, in this country or other countries, I mean, you've probably had those experiences where you just marveled in the glory of nature and you just can't figure out how to take that home with you. And he's like, well, what if we, what if we were able to somehow capture that? And um, I remember him telling me that story and I, I totally identified with it uh, on a number of occasions. And then I did the demo and then I said, wow, they, you, you can actually do that. You can actually, there's some, as Brendan often says, there's this switch that goes off in your head when you achieve true immersion where you actually do something your brain's telling you that you're there. Um, for me, there was actually a demo early on that we never released, but it, we, it was at a boxing match. And I don't know if how many of you have ever been to an actual boxing match, but when you're, in a, you're sitting near the, 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 the ring, these guys hit each other really hard. And it doesn't come through on television. But when you're there, you can f almost feel how hard these guys are hitting each other. And for the first time ever, I felt, like I didn't actually feel it, but I, I felt, I, my brain thought I was feeling these guys hitting each other. And that for me was the thing that went off in my mind. And I said, this is, this is gonna be really big because there's just so many different areas in the content world that people can build on this as a platform. And there just aren't that many opportunities as an investor to get in on the ground floor of a platform um, that if you look at the history of venture capital, it tends to be how venture firms are built oftentimes is with those you know, big investments early in a platform. So that was really kind of the story of how we got involved. That's really great. And, and Tipitat, you have the fortune or misfortune of looking at over 400 companies. And first of all, how do you really process all that? And, and what was your criteria to select and, and, and really help uh, the ones you chose. So when we looked at the different companies, and what it really represented too was how diverse VR is. Everyone focuses on the games and entertainment aspect, but actually VR is so much more than that. VR and AR represent the next computing platforms and the things that you can do with it, especially for healthcare, for education, for enterprise. There's all these different applications. So yeah, it was 400 plus companies, but all doing very, very different things. Like, I mean, there was a little bit of pile up, everyone trying to be the next YouTube for VR or whatever, but, but for the most part, it was pretty broad. And then what we did, and when we selected the River Class, we wanted to represent that, that diversity. And the companies that we had were, especially when you're talking about like, how are these companies gonna sustain themselves while we wait for VR to become mass market? Well, a lot of these companies, especially in enterprise or medical healthcare, they were actually already deployed having customers bringing in revenue. And so that's kind of how you think about it. And then for the content companies too, you think about, okay, well, how can you become a services company in the meanwhile, get some of this like, you know, client work that's based off media companies want to do advertising and bring in a little bit of money to help you kind of go along. I think Otherworld, they're not one of our companies, but they're, uh, they're doing a great example of showing how that can be done. And then the nice thing now with this ecosystem is that players like Oculus, um, Unreal, and Weaver, they understand how important content is, and so they're actually building up funds to, f to help produce content. And so you can actually look through and see, okay, who are the companies that they're you know, vetting and giving money to, and what are the projects they're funding? And it's interesting to see, especially Unreal, it, you'd think it would just be games, but no, there's a lot of cinematic and art pieces as well. And so you get to see this broad sense. There was a big uh, data visualization in VR uh, contest that they did. And so you'll see that the broad uses of this technology is just so widespread and really exciting. And Tupita, you have a great background in gaming. So how do you see VR? I mean, we talked about AR gaming and VR gaming. Sure. What, what's your vision? So w when we look at gaming, uh, what I like to tell all the game companies that we talk to is don't think about creating games that exist great on current systems, like first-person shooters. They're fantastic playing it on your Xbox or PS4. But think about what games couldn't have been done but now make sense or that are now interesting. And for me, it's not about making games. It's about making dreams come true. And when I create like simple experiences, but someone comes out to me and just being like, oh my God, that was a dream come true. And they give you a hug and they're like teary eyed. You're like, yes, that means I've created something that's really not just novel, but valuable. And that's really what we want to focus on when you try to create VR entertainment, something that couldn't have been done in any other medium. And that really showcases what 
pure imagination can be. And uh, Cliff, when you were involved, obviously Oculus had a you know, gaming-centric focus, mm -hmm. and and a part of it is that externalities, you know, having the number of devices out there to be uh, available. And what are your expectations from uh, you know the sort of mega market perspective that you really need this install base to grow and really come to certain levels to, to then, as Jeff said, there are novel ways to monetize, but ultimately you really need like tens of millions of devices with, with viewers and, and other cardboard type uh, gadgets. Right, so it was great when Google obviously announced their, their cardboard. Obviously it was a little bit maybe of a, uh, a joke towards Facebook, but um, it had a big movement towards really launching VR as well. I, I think that move was just as important as Facebook acquiring Oculus. Because it, it really introduced that mobile, you know, especially for our focus, is a big part of what is going to introduce VR to the masses. Uh, Oculus product, you know, HTC, Sony Morpheus, those are all great products. And obviously they're mostly designed for gaming, and they'll tap into the early adopters of gamers, and they'll, they'll grow a market there. But really, it, it's got to be mobile that's going to have to drive the numbers into the tens of millions of users, potential users out there that would have access to VR. So a lot of our focus is really about how to create content that we can put, make accessible on mobile devices. One of my favorite tweets, I think it was about a month ago, was some guy in the New York City subway wearing a Gear VR. It was like, that's the future, and it's now. That was yeah. awesome. So do you have a number, say, in the US we have to have X many millions of cardboard devices out there, or is there like critical mass that you say, beyond that, that's really sort of uh, ready to monetize? Um, I think we're ready to monetize now, and I think we have to start creating an ecosystem now. But what's going to drive that? It's not going to be the HMDs. It's going to be that, that killer piece of content or that experience that people just want. They want to pay for that. You know, it, it's, you know, there's things that we're working on now that we can't officially announce, but you know, it's, it's really designed that people will pay for this content. And we believe that it's, it's powerful enough, there's a loyal enough audience for the, these types of content that people will pay for. So I don't think we wait for the HMDs. We, we have to drive the demand. And again, it's going to be that compelling content that people are going to want to pay for. Alex? Yeah, see, the, th the thing about monetization is if, if the content creators can't make money, they're not going to devote their time and efforts to this medium. So the, all the platforms have to enable these guys to make money at some point. Um, and I think it's soon. Oculus can burn a lot of cash for a long time. But the content creators can't afford to. Right. So, um, and we all know that if there's no great content, no one's going to buy these devices. So there's this no, there's a cycle that's set up such that if you don't enable the content creators to, to do well, they're not going to be excited about this new medium. So I, I think monetization, as Cliff said, is going to have to be earlier. Otherwise, it's, none of this will be successful. Yeah, makes sense. And Jeff, you talked about novel monetization, uh, you know, strategies you're advising your portfolio companies towards. What what are what do you suggest right now early in the market? They could do sponsorships, or they could you know find other ways to well, to get some income. Well, we want it to always be part of their business. We don't want them to be working on X and then over on the side developing you know Y technology for a third party. I mean that doesn't make sense for right. us. But one instance on the education side, we have two companies that are doing really interesting things in education. One in immersive language training. We think that it's very good. We think that there's a spot for that in the market. And two is uh, you know, recreations of historical scenes. The first is we encourage him to sell these lesson plans. That This is not a give it away strategy. Uh, he has to go out and find people that are willing to pay to be trained to learn languages in VR. Uh, it's going to be difficult for sure, but giving it away won't teach him anything about his business. Secondly, on the content creation side, uh, we're looking at it as a subscription model. That here's an experience we have, it's the Roman Colosseum, you know, it's subscribed for $5, $10, $7, play with the number, and then it will be delivered to you once a month, you'll get another experience like a National Geographic model. Now ultimately, the plan is for him to be an education marketplace, that you can have a lot of simulations, you can, you can perform and provide a lot of educational content, um, but first and foremost, to Alex's point, there has to be compelling content, it has to be good, people have to be willing to pay for it, or the other content creators aren't going to jump on board. So part of the, the, the trick here is to prove to all the other content creators that if you create something really compelling, people will buy it. Yeah, yeah content is really crucial to platform adoption, as you all, all know. 
to be that when you look at the gaming companies and you have you know Boost VC and Highland, Redpoint, and others are investing in in a VR and AR technologies and, and other you know ecosystem players. How do you really advise them in terms of getting some capital, not only getting capital from Boost, but what do they do beyond Boost? And and uh, how do you, you know, advise them on monetization approaches? Because sure. right now, I mean, by the way, how many of you think this is your VR device? One, two, three. Wow. Okay. <laughs> but do sure. you believe, by the way, this is the you know sort of device that you can consume VR? Absolutely. I, I think, you know, mobile is going to be strong VR, but the, uh, I think there's two different things too. People get them confused. I, I think, you know, Tim's done a great job of explaining between like the different types of VR that's out there, immersive VR versus regular VR, or what's currently considered mobile VR versus like desktop high-end VR. And you advise those companies differently. But I do like to say, you know, I tell the companies too that content studios, like, yeah, there's definitely investment in VR. How many of them are game studios? Very few, far in between. And Gaming studios are always a hard investment for VCs, and it's going to continue to be so even in VR. And the one thing I say to them too is think about game experiences that are really, that you can't do anywhere else, and that's why people will pay a premium to do it, because the competition is different. It's like, oh yeah, I can play you know, a first person shooter here or there, I could play a strategy game here or there, but I can't play a certain type of VR game anywhere else, and, and try to find that game. And then don't think about, oh, I want to make a $10 game or a $5 game. You actually have to make, especially on the high end, you have to make a $1,000 game because you have to justify buying the hardware and, and everything as well. So that's why I say like really deep, dig deep and build some. And it's not about making it a million dollar production, but it's just about making it, designing it so smart and so unique that you're like, wow, I couldn't have done this in any other way. I think you know, one of the best examples of, of a VR experience I've ever done was Tilt Brush. And it's just this beautiful thing where you're painting in VR. It's just amazing. And, and the best thing about it, too, like, it's not one of those projects where it costs millions of dollars to create. And it was just them being smart and thinking about what could we do in VR that we couldn't do elsewhere. And using all of the different things that VR allows, especially with gesture control and 3D display. And in terms of the evolution of the sector, do you expect, similar to what happened on the mobile side, that, you know, in a, as Be uh, Jeff said, Angry Birds really sort of proved the, qual uh, the you know, uh, importance of the quality content, really try to drive the platform and said, hey, this is your entertainment device, yep. right? And, and then, so around summer of 2011, sort of, sort of premium started taking over. Do you expect to have small, as Nicole was saying yesterday, you know, sort of high quality short experience and maybe monetize on a premium basis and then evolve from there? I think that's possible at scale, and mobile does represent that. Like cardboard's already said, there's always already over one million cardboard out there, and yeah, you know, I know people have hundreds of thousands of downloads in their cardboard apps, and so yeah, there's possible. It's possible to get there, but for me, you know, I, I still think that. I was in mobile games for a while, social games, and it was always about the search for whales. It was never about trying to get pennies from millions of people. It was trying to find that one or two crazy people that are gonna give, give you $20,000, really, right? And so the idea is here with VR, you actually are pre-selecting the whales. Only whales are want VR and can pay for this much for the content, so you have to think, okay, well, if someone's serious about spending two, $3,000 for a VR experience, that, uh, like to get the hardware, well, then maybe you can create $100, $200, piece of software that would really satisfy their needs in a way that couldn't be otherwise. Like, how much would you pay to have dinner with Taylor Swift? You know, I, I think there are plenty of people that would pay hundreds of dollars each. And so now with VR, you could create those kinds of experiences. So Jeff, how much would you pay to have dinner with Taylor Swift? <laughs> uh, I, I, I might have to pay more than I'd like because I have a 13 year old daughter. Oh, there we go. There, see? <laughs> Please tell me that's not really an option. I have to ask these guys. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to add on the gaming side, and, and we really believe this, that um, a lot of the game developers that we've seen have tried to tell us that they're going to be platform agnostic and they're going to build on every platform, and we just don't advise that right now because it's very difficult. Even in 2015, mobile companies have Android developers and they have iOS developers, and they're different. The nuances are different. Developers, Game developers specifically need to focus on being really good at one thing. And that one thing uh, includes you know, owning a platform, having a hit game in one thing. So if your game is an Oculus game, don't also try to divert resources to making it work on cardboard or on Samsung gear right now. So we think that that's important in the gaming space. It's really tough to make a hit. A game, and game companies in particular have a difficult time raising money. We know a lot of 
uh, VCs and angel investors who have made money in the gaming space. And unlike investors who have made money in enterprise or have made money in direct to consumer, they usually go back into those spaces. Game people typically don't. They say, eh, I don't know, it's really hard. It's a hits, hits driven business. So the only way to survive, I think, as a VR gamer is to, to make a great experience full stop. So you suggest that they focus on one platform and excel in that? And we do right now, yeah. And in terms of the game experience or sort of the design, do you have a preference saying do a vertical slice and then see how that you know gets traction, then add more venues to it? Or what, what's, what are your, if you look at a game company in the VR, obviously, as, as you said, you know, hit-driven business and VCs by and large moved on. But uh, what would be sort of attractive criteria for you? Um, that's really difficult to say right now because going back to my earlier comment, we just don't know what, what's going to resonate with uh, with the consumer. So I think that she wants oh, you to put the mic to your face. So I, I think we don't know what's going to resonate with the consumer. So I think that building a game with unique features. One of our companies is a game called Pixel Rip, and uh, they are doing some really interesting things. Very meta. It's a game of inside a game. They have plans for a series. They had plans for uh, being platform agnostic. Now they're really focused on this, you know, small, smaller game, you know, directly for Oculus. Oculus is invested in them, and I think that if they really focus on that and get that right, they'll become known as you know, more than just a game. Uh, so if I could just add, so the one thing that we tell the game studios too that when they come by is definitely like, you know, people really don't know what session lengths are going to be for, you know, games. Think about episodic content. Don't make this huge investment where you're going to go into a cave, build this amazing game in a year, and then you come out with something and, you know, the whole industry's changed. It's, you know, experiment quick, quick iteration, be willing to throw away, you know, kill your darlings, find real fun, real something that's interesting and different, but don't try to do it with money. Try to do it by being smart and clever. I was just going to add just to one of your points. I'm on the board of Telltale Games, and even though they're considered a game company, I don't think of them as a game company. They're a storytelling company. And you know their content works on all platforms, all devices, but they're entertaining their, their audience base. And there is a bit of interactivity, but they really are a storytelling company. So I do think storytelling, whether it's in live action VR with what we're doing in, in gaming, I think is real important as well. And Alex, on the, the sort of capital uh, demand side, uh, to the extent that you can share with us, does Highland look at VR, AR as a sector and thematic investment area that you'll have eventual number of investments covering different aspects of it? Well, I, th I think it's, doubt it's doubtless that we will have multiple investments. In fact, we already do have multiple, because we're investing in Leap Motion, we led the Series A there as well. Although, again, we did that before VR was really a thing uh, in its current incarnation. Um, our, our more general thesis actually didn't have anything to do with VR. It had to do with the application of computer vision techniques in consumer devices. Um, the aha moment for me was the Microsoft Connect coming out. Um, and that was what led us into this, what is now, I guess, a four-year journey down this path of uh, investing in companies like Leap and John. And uh, I only think that that the types of consumer mediums that are accessible to people are going to be more three-dimensional. They're going to be more immersive. Um, we're not investors in Sketchfab, for example, but if you look at Sketchfab as a company, that's a very interesting, they are in a very interesting position to capture the VR, AR market because uh, they didn't start that way, but they have a huge um, digital asset base that's three-dimensional, right? So um, we think of this as, as the, ne a next, the next medium and the next platform, and uh, we will doubtfully, doubtlessly have a number of investments. A number of them may not start that way, um, but we're, we're, we generally focus on the technology shifts and look at what's possible that wasn't possible before, and that often leads us into new platforms. Do you feel like now other VCs are sort of accelerating their ex maybe thoughts and, and expectations in the sector? You know, recent announcement, Allspace got a uh, new uh, round of financing, and we were, I think, announced that HTC and maybe even Valve invested in the company in more on the CGI sort of focus. But, you know, do you feel like the, the VC market or VC uh, colleagues need to be further educated? And, and what do you see? Uh, I hope they're not educated, because I want to do all the good <laughs> deals. Um, all right. So and I, 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 want, I want them, but I, I love it when they do follow on financings. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think that they, I think there is definitely a learning curve with, with VR that by virtue of the fact that if you haven't tried VR, 
you can know nothing about it. It's really, really hard to make a qualified statement about it if you haven't really tried it. And not just said that, but tried many, many experiences in it. And, and just by virtue of the fact that you can't just open up a web browser and try the product, it's, it's excluded a lot of people. A lot of people have, you know, have dismissed it offhand. And I, and, I, and I know people who have done that and then come back around to it and gone, oh, wow, I didn't realize it could do this. And, and by the way, the technology is changing so fast that you, know, you may have tried the DK1, gotten really sick and sort of swore it off and you'd be missing out on a lot of stuff right now. So um, a lot of people are coming around. We're seeing more, de more deal flow. We're seeing more competition um, for deals in VR and AR, but it's not anywhere near what we're seeing in the, in the sort of the broad technology market. And I, I think that's, that's just naturally how things go. There's usually a few investors who, um, who pioneer a space and then everyone else kind of fast follows. Uh, the one thing I'd like to add, whoa, this one's really live. Uh, I've done a lot of education for a lot of other v uh, VCs that wanted to learn more about VR space, and it seems like people are getting interested. But again, I, I think for a lot of the people, I mean, VR is still early stage, you know, it's three to five years away before it hits mass consumer adoption. And so when all these companies come up, you know, oh, I, I think I can raise VC money. And it's like, actually, you know, you really want to start raising angel money first then you raise VC money and you can't really shortcut it and you don't think that just because a couple people are raising crazy amounts of money that you're going to go out there and raise that same amount. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, it's like there's all these like very common sense sort of statements that get made at, at, at conferences and things like, you know, VCs don't invest in hits-driven businesses. You know, all, but the, the reality situation is I know two hits-driven studio businesses in the last month that have gotten venture funding. Three, sorry, three. They, none of them have been announced. And they're all based on the team, probably, right? They're all based on badass teams. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I wouldn't say there's a hard and fast rule. I, I think the best teams will get funding, um, and they'll get funding from good firms where they have prior relationships. So if there's any rule in venture capital, it's like if you know a team really well and you know how good they are, it's worth a small amount of capital to see what they can do in a new, in a new market, I, I think. So we'll, we'll modify the common sense uh, statement to <laughs> VCs invest in badass teams. So uh, Alex for that. That's, that's I'll, absolutely I'll, I'll right. I'll stand up for that. Yeah, I, I would definitely. And, and Jeff, uh, how do you feel from the sort of the VR, AR ecosystem? You guys are out there investing in these early stage companies and you know, working with Alex and other VCs. You know, what do you expect the, the venture environment uh, and how, how, how is it going to evolve to help you? Because what you're doing is extremely important, but you need the capital base behind you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Uh, certainly. So, um, you know, I believe I agree with Alex 100%. You know, one of the things that you asked earlier, I said we invest in teams and teams that have a passion to get this done. So, their background and their passion combined uh, makes us want to make that investment. Uh, whether it's a hits driven business or not. So from a VC perspective, from a follow on capital perspective, uh, we do a lot of education of VCs as well. We talk to a lot of our limited partners and co-investors and you've got to show it to them. The, the, they're just like the consumer. Until they see it, they don't have that aha moment. So I think that it's a combination of educating the market, but, but, but that's just really one small component of it. Really, it's heads down, build product, make it really, really cool, and then, and then VCs will have to pay attention. Make people pay attention based upon the product itself. That's the first rule that we have. No amount of conferences or TechCrunch articles is going to attract the attention. The attention is driven by how, how good the product is. In terms of the product, uh, Cliff, uh, you know, obviously it's great to watch you know, Paul McCartney in concert, but when you go back to gaming, and how do you see the branded IP helping to the growth and expansion and adoption? Um, I think with branded, it, it's really helping to, well, one, fund content. It's not so much commercials, but brands want to be associated with some of these experiences. And not just the content, but also helping with the devices. So again, brands love mobile because there's a huge market out there. So if we can do, you know, flat pack a, a cardboard viewer with a good piece of content and get that out there to the masses, that's very attractive to the brands. So th those are more of the sort of conversations we're having that help starts creating that monetization system for VR. And in terms of, if you look at, say, Telltale, you know, the standard model is you license an IP from a studio and you have a minimum guarantee, then you do revenue share and all that. And as we talk, VR, you can't do that. So what's the new model? 
Well, again, it's not, we want to get into the, the rights business of, of paying for rights in VR yet. Those conversations are starting to happen, but you know, how do you put a number on that when it's, it's still not an audience? So it's really, you know, for us, it's been working with some top talent. You know, Paul McCartney has a label, but when Paul McCartney says he wants to do something, the label bows and says whatever you want, Sir, per Sir Paul. And so we've been working with a couple of artists that have that sort of influence and obviously they have large followers that we work with them on creating VR experiences that taps into those audiences and obviously that attracts the brands. And, and to be that, when you look at the game companies, uh, do you see a sort of must have need to say, look, studios have to think differently, you know, avail your branded IP, so kickstart the market, you know, let's create awesome games and then that would benefit everyone. Yeah, I think there's definitely this sense of, you know, again, thinking about like, you know, the investments that have been made, like, you know, Rothenberg invested in Relo Game Studio, they were ex-Call of Duty, ex-Disney artist, so it was definitely a, like, you know, you look at the solid team, and then they also had an amazing demo, and, but then you think about, like, what other people are doing in the business, like, uh, was it Starkiller, like, 505 Games, you know, they just announced a John Wick game, they, they're doing a Walking Dead VR game, too, and the power of these brands, but I always feel like there's this opportunity though when there is a, a platform shift like this to create the brand new brands like this is where the angry birds or you know this is where mario came from you know if you look at when animation was first created this is where disney like mickey mouse came from and so now with vr you're going to have this chance to create new brands of ip uh, new ip that's going to engage with audiences in a brand new way and with vr being a megaphone for amplifying empathy and connecting with digital characters i think it's going to be the most powerful new brands that are going to be created in vr yeah, and uh, sorry, I, I took a lot of time asking questions, but I'd love to sort of turn it over to you guys and spend the next 10, 15 minutes about your questions and what your expectations, and start with you. Um, thank you. Um, I, I guess for each of the panelists, um, what's the most exciting company that you think is in the market today that you're not personally associated with? Uh, I'll answer that real quick. Uh, Tilt Brush. So I mentioned them a couple of times. Well, actually, the company is Gilman and Hackett. They were actually acquired by Google a couple months ago. But again, uh, you know, it's a combination of they're actually creating a creative tool in VR so you can express yourself and actually do something productive. But then it is unlike anything else. Painting in VR, it's like the, the, that, that cheesy, like those commercials they used to have where people would paint with like light, but it was just like a slow shutter effect. So they actually didn't know what they were doing when they were doing it. But now you can actually see it in real time. It's like a dream come true. And I honestly like joked that maybe I'll quit my job when the vibe comes out, so I'll just paint and tilt brush all day. But now that I'm not working, maybe I can just do that now. <laughs> so what about a non-Google company? A non-Google company. Well, they weren't a Google company. Uh, no, I'm not associated. Um, my media thought was Epic, and, and a little bit to what Tip Chat said. I mean, they're, everyone thinks of them as a gaming company. You know, I know the people there well. They're really pushing the envelope with the technology that's going to create um, a lot of possibilities to use that technology for mo much more than gaming. So my problem is the companies I'm most excited about are in stealth mode, so I, I can't really talk about them. Um, I mentioned Sketchfab. I think Sketchfab has an interesting uh, path into uh, into actually AR first and, and eventually VR. Um, so I'll, I'll give them I'll give them a shout out. I like those guys. Yeah, well, <laughs> associated with. Um, so not associated with just because I don't know enough about it, uh, but. Uh, you know, I'm really excited to see what Magic Leap does. I know that that's one that everybody talks about, but uh, not everybody can be right, and all of the rumors that I've heard can't all be true. So I'm interested to see when that comes out what it is. Associated with, um, you know, just really recently, but it was one that we worked with, that we wanted to work with, is a company called Janus VR, uh, and they uh, are creating, empowering people to create worlds inside VR using really novel technologies, and they have a lot of following. You know, in my estimation, uh, they've got as many people using their service as any other, you know, VR provider right now. It's just really neat to see so many other people get into the space through one meeting. Alrighty, do we have uh, other questions? Um, so we talked a lot about content kind of driving, driving the market and kind of the need to, um, for those content companies to gain further funding. Um, they can kind of do projects maybe where they're partnering or they're gaining sponsorship revenue. 
but if, let's say a content company doesn't really have any sort of specific sexy technology or platform, but it's doing a lot of production work, it's gaining traction, it's building a brand for itself. In today's market for, you know, let, let's say they're past their seed funding, what kind of traction is sexy for an A round um, in the market today? Like if I said, wanted to come to you and say, hey, you know, we've put out 12 pieces, we've released it, we've had X amount of users kind of adopt it, we have uh, <laughs> media mass team, not <laughs> Me media mass, yeah, yeah. mediums are too, yeah, too bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, ass team. <laughs> um, like, what, what, what? How do you think about that? Like, there's a million install base for cardboard. Like, are you, are you thinking about? So like, you're talking about VR, speci VR specifically. Okay. VR content specifically. Well, I'm not even sure if these microphones work anymore. To be honest. Um, I'm just going to pretend like it, it's working. Um, so uh, the reality of the situation is I, I think there's going to be a couple gaming properties that in the next year really become sort of a standard that people will, will talk about. Like, oh, my God, you got to get the Oculus. You can play this. Or you got to get the Sony. You, got, you can play this. And, um, and it's going to be less of an absolute numbers thing. And it's going to be more of a here is like an early market share or leader kind of thing. Um, you know, I'm sure when Rovio first released Angry Birds, it was nowhere near, uh, well, I know for a fact, it was nowhere near the number of absolute installs and, and engaged users, but it, it, was, it was sucking all the wind out of the, uh, the room when anyone talked about games. It was just a fundamentally different game than anything that had been developed before it. And I think you have to look at what that's going to be in, in VR. That being said, that may not be enough. That may not be enough to get investors interested. I, I, I tend to think either you're, if you're kind of a gaming company, it's either you've built a single piece of IP that is so ridiculously profitable on its unit economics, like a supercell you know, did with, with Clash of Clans, that it just, you know, look, 50%, whatever, whatever the margins are, but like, you know, let's say it's 50% EBITDA margin business. Like, those are going to get funded. Someone's going to put money into that, even if they only can take out cash through a dividend, right? It's going it's to be ridiculously successful. Or the other alternative is you, you've developed a process to create a number of IPs, maybe that are, that are linked together, um, and, uh, and, and, are, and, are, and have a really great strategy for distributing them. Um, those things have to be demonstrable. So from my perspective, it's less about the, 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 the single KPI, and it's more about what's the thesis for building a sustainable business in the long term. Um, how can you put that together? So it's hard to give you just a hard number. Uh, great. First of all, great panel. Uh, Nicole Zero from, from Z Design. So if uh, investment is going to, quote unquote, badass teams, uh, then uh, I was curious because in, uh, in the talk I gave yesterday on five strateg design strategies for better VR games, uh, the first one is matching the, uh, the audience with the, you know, the, new, the new platform. So if you're ma if basically, if funding is only going to teams that have mastered old platforms, how do you know that they're going to create the monetization, the new monetization model that only works in VR? How are you going to get be sure that your team, if they're successful in the old gen, they're going to be successful in the new gen? It seems like that's you know there's a bit of a flaw in the logic there. S since I originated the flawed logic, I, I'll, I'll respond to this question. <laughs> um, so it's. No one can predict the future. My general thesis with investing is that people who are, you know, top one percent performers in their field or in their peer group tend to continue to be top one percent performers up until they decide to stop trying. Uh, you know, and um, and that doesn't mean they're always winning, but they tend they tend to just kind of do well and do really really well in what they do. And you know, if you continue to if if they're if they're properly motivated and have the right people around them, they will continue to probably do that in the next medium. That doesn't mean that just because you were really successful in the old medium, you're going to take all the metaphors from that old medium into the new medium. The best people do start start with a white sheet of paper when they get into a new business. And um, I look at the guys again. The guys started Jaunt as an example of this. I mean, these guys built um, the CTO and the CEO had both built middleware companies in the '90s that they took public. That couldn't be farther from what we do at Jaunt, right? But they know a lot about distributed systems. They know a lot about complexity and like shipping complex software that has to be, you know, that has to work. They know about a lot about building cloud services. So there's a lot of skills they were able to take into this new thing. But they had to invent a lot of stuff no one had ever done before. So I, I, I just think when I say badass teams, I don't necessarily mean like you're going to copy what you did before and just do it again in a different context. In fact, the quality of badassness, if you if you want to use that term, 
is the ability to, in, to be innovative in a, new, in a new place where the rules are not defined. So basically, you want to look at what is, what is success. And so if you look at it simply from the, um, the, the monetary success or you know, maybe even it's just the install base success in the old platform, mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that uh, I think operations and some other things you know, will transfer. Mm -hmm. But from the creative like content play, mm -hmm. uh, the ability of the team really is going to be to have them, uh, it, it are teams that are going to be able to innovate, think a new way, apply what they know from the, the old genres into the new genres, or come from left field, you know, come in from film, come in from something else. In the innovation work that we do with our clients, um, it's, there's a different type of thinking that's required. And uh, so what you're, that's what you're looking for. And I think that's got to be a big slice in when you're evaluating these teams. Of course, I'm not an investor, so. Well, I did, know, uh, my, closing, my, my closing statement, I guess, would just be, there's a big difference between building a piece of content and starting a company. And company builders are, are rare. And, they, and they, their skill sets tend to transfer across industries and across sectors. Uh, if you want to just make a great piece of content, that's great. And you, you might be able to do that. But if you want to go build a company that stands the test of time, it turns out that there's a certain set of skills that are necessary, and it's hard to acquire those. Um, and yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, we have uh, another question in the back here. So Jeff, your, your advice to content developers was to focus on a single platform and not be platform agnostic. And to a content developer, that's absolutely petrifying, um, especially when you're looking at a market now that has so many different competing platforms. I think every two weeks, every month, um, I, see, I see something, a new idea, a new hardware platform pop up. And many of them seem to be very undifferentiated. Um, often with very little protectable, unique IP associated with the hardware itself. So m my, my question is really, how do you navigate that water? And, and really to the larger panel, when do you start to see clear dominant players opening up? Um, it feels until you have a really clear path on the hardware, it's going to be difficult to spend those ten, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars that you currently have, for example, going against the current consoles. Yeah, it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. It's uncomfortable to hedge your bets, but great companies are not made by hedging their bets. I mean, they're made because the entrepreneurs are passionate, they have a vision, they work 20 hours a day sometimes to get it done, and we have really small teams. They just don't have the ability to focus on a number of things at once, and so they have to skate to where the puck's gonna be. They have to pick the platform that works best with their concept. Uh, over time, if they're successful, of course they're gonna become you know, multi, multi-platform, multi-device, but uh, I'm speaking, you know, specifically of very early stage companies, and you could develop on a platform that goes away. I don't think the platform wars are anywhere close to being settled. Uh, you know, the, um, what we see today, uh, probably in 10 years, uh, there will be new entrants into the market. Some of the entrants that we all think are dominant today may go away. That's happened time and time again over the last 20, 20 years in the technology world. So. Um, you know, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's the advice that we give is, you know, have c your courage of conviction to be right on what you're doing. I think just give my two cents on that. Just there's technology is moving so fast. I mean, there's, there's so many opportunities. I mean, we see it in VR. And I think for any kind of startup, I can't emphasize focus enough. And at some point, you got to place a bet on yourself and just go, I, I think this is the right path for me right now. I have to focus all of our energy on just making one piece of great product. And then once you know, I've gone through that process and learned, then I can look out a little bit and, and kind of reevaluate the terrain and, and then kind of move from there. But I, I'd say for any startup, you know, number one is just focusing on making one great piece of product or piece of content. All right, I think that's uh, all the time we have now.